Hello fellow humans, my name's Tara. I'm a Korean-Canadian cosplayer and writer, and I'd like to discuss a serious topic with you. Yes, while dressed as Deku from Hero Academia, a 16-year-old anime character with gravity-defying green hair. And yes, part of me is also like, what the fuck is she doing? But I'll explain the logic on that at the end of this video. With the devastation of COVID-19, so soon followed by the social upheaval ignited by the murder of George Floyd, I know it feels like the world is in shambles right now, with some parts literally on fire. If you're like me and have been fortunate enough to have grown up in a relatively safe and wealthy democratic country, it can feel shocking and surreal to see that these issues of violent institutional racism and police brutality still can exist today. It's 2020. We're civilized and woke, right? And that is actually part of the issue, that so many of us tend to overestimate racial equality. After comparing federal data with the perceptions of societal progress made in reducing economic inequality based on race, Yale professor Jennifer A. Richardson notes that Americans tend to be too optimistic about the scope of racial progress in the United States, specifically in the domain of economic outcomes. Unfounded optimism of this sort is likely to hinder efforts to reduce racial economic inequality or even discover its causes. People will not attempt to solve problems that they are either unaware of or believe do not exist. Yet, whether or not we see it or believe it, systemic racism and racial violence still persist today. So much so that for decades, America has been caught in some sort of grotesque Groundhog Day. Only instead of repeating the events of a single day, it's a cycle of the undue police killing of a black civilian, followed by public outcry, protests, and riots. And of course, police responding to protests against excessive use of force with, well, excessive use of force. So much so that Martin Luther King Jr.'s words are still so eerily and honestly fucking tragically relevant. Our nation summers of riots are caused by our nation's winters of delay. And as long as America postpones justice, we stand in the position of having these recurrences of violence and riots over and over again. Social justice and progress are the absolute guarantors of riot prevention. And it can feel demoralizing, even depressing, to be reminded that Dr. King's call for change has yet to be fully answered 52 years after it was made half a century, nearly two generations, and for too many, an entire lifetime spent waiting for change. It feels like a slap in the face to realize that, oh shit, no, the civil rights movement was never truly fulfilled. However, at the same time, a slap in the face can be invigorating, can be an awakening. My God, pull yourself together! At the same time, it's important to not lose hope, to remember that change is possible, that despite so many repetitions of history, progress has been made in recent years. Since the birth of the Black Lives Matter movement and the Ferguson protests in 2014, police killings of unarmed civilians have gone down across all ethnic groups. So many people are trying to turn this issue into a matter of black versus white. And it does not help when news outlets describe George Floyd's homicide in the same manner. White cop kills black man. As if the cop who kept guard, who kept pushing back the bystanders who were begging for them to check for a pulse, wasn't Asian American. As if it somehow wouldn't have been institutional racism had the cop who knelt on George Floyd's neck been black themselves. As if self-racism or internalized racism isn't also a thing. And I hope to harass and beat each and every black person I see with extreme prejudice. Racism is not a matter of black or white. The truth is that A, we are all a part of this problem, which isn't to say that we are all racist, although we do all possess unconscious biases. 
and that B, there are distinct dimensions of racism. Intrapersonal, where children internalize racial biases and identify white dolls as good and black dolls as bad. Which doll is the bad doll? Fucking heartbreaking. Interpersonal, where we unconsciously hold implicit biases about one another based on stereotypes and experience which when left unchecked can quickly turn into explicit discrimination and assholery into verbalized or otherwise expressed ideas about who's inferior or superior as you can see from my flat concentric nipple rings i'm a member of this planet's top race okay that's good uh don't focus too much on the last part but i'm Daryl jefferson i'm a landscaper and i'll be damned if that ripple nipple bitch's race is superior the co nipple people will rule this world you shut your mouth you dirty knife nipple bastards what'd you say to me you target chest piece of shit race war institutional affecting our chances for employment promotion and professional credit community affecting the societal resources to which we have access including the state of our schools and our neighborhoods and systemic affecting the realms of immigration banking and the criminal justice system let's focus on the last one for now but first what exactly is the prison industrial complex the prison industrial complex is a system situated at the intersection of government and private interests it uses oh. prisons as a solution to social political and economic problems it includes oh. human rights violations the death penalty slave labor policing courts the media political oh. prisoners and the elimination of dissent i love huey freeman while the gap has been closing over the last decade, the racial and ethnic makeup of U.S. prisons continues to look substantially different from the demographics of the country as a whole. In 2017, there were 1,549 black prisoners for every 100,000 black adults, nearly six times the imprisonment rate for white prisoners, and nearly double the rate for Hispanic prisoners. And yes, some people will certainly point out, maybe that's because black people commit more crime. So let's look at the data. It's true. There is a disproportionate representation of black Americans as both the perpetrators and the victims of homicide. Between 1980 and 2008, the victimization rates for blacks were six times higher than those for whites. The offending rates for blacks were more than seven times higher than the rates for whites. This phenomenon is casually referred to as black on black violence. This term is problematic in and of itself, since most homicides are interracial, with 84% of white victims killed by white perpetrators and 93% of black victims killed by black perpetrators. But this term can also have detrimental impacts in two ways. First, the casual classification of black on black violence can lead to the perception that black citizens are somehow innately, inherently more prone to violence or immorality, which can encourage officers to pursue harsher and less thoughtful approaches, concentrating intensive enforcement efforts or zero tolerance policies on blacks in specific public spaces. Second, this choice in words has the potential to devalue black life while overshadowing the importance of harmful social conditions. Research and analysis reveal that black on black homicide and by extension more general black on black violence is largely concentrated among a small number of criminally active individuals and occurs in a small number of high risk settings within disadvantaged neighborhoods. And when you look at the concentration of criminally active individuals, one thing they have in common with their homicide victims is their age. Both black homicide victims and arrested black homicide offenders were primarily young. Approximately one third of murder victims and almost half the offenders are under the age of 25. And this is important because evidence shows that the greatest deterrent against serious violence is something called collective efficacy. The capacity of neighborhood residents to achieve a common set of goals and exert control over youth and public spaces. Regardless, homicides account for a small portion of crime in the U.S. And racial disparities are less pronounced when it comes to non-lethal violence. So. What can explain the racial disparities in America's prison population? I know, I know, I know! I'll give you a hint. I am not a crook. Actually, he didn't say it like that. Why is that intonation my mental soundbite of him? I am not a crook's head. Better. 
Since President Nixon first declared a war on drugs, the U.S. government has, to no avail, spent countless billions of dollars in efforts to eradicate the supply of drugs. Yet in going on 40 years, this policy hasn't reduced illicit drug use or death by overdose. Even before the recent waves of legalization, are you seriously telling me that you've never smoked pot? I'm asking you if you're of age, of course. The clearest result of America's war on drugs has been mass incarceration, disproportionately of minorities. And that's no coincidence. John Ehrlichman, Nixon's Council on Domestic Affairs, made the following confession in 1994. The Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. Wow. I mean, on one hand, no fucking shit, but it is pretty shocking that he fully confessed to it. This strategy was so simple, yet so effective, Azula herself could not have concocted a more efficiently evil plan. Another consequence of the war on drugs has been the birth of warrior policing. A style of law enforcement that trains officers to constantly anticipate violence, despite a broad decrease in officer fatality since the days of alcohol prohibition, and to reach for their gun as an instinctive rather than as a last response. Couple this cops are at war with crime mindset with ticket and arrest quotas or so-called productivity goals and the financial incentives of fines and civil forfeiture and you get the aggressive and invasive style of law enforcement we know today, encouraging over-policing and making unnecessary contact with civilians which in turn fosters feelings of degradation and resentment. Add to this mix a dash of camaraderie and unconditional loyalty found among the brothers and sisters in blue, a natural cultural phenomenon in any environment in which a group experiences or expects to experience violence together, like in the army, and I hate to make this comparison, but yeah, in gangs a totally understandable but ultimately problematic mindset of we have one another's backs no matter what also known as a blue code of silence the refusal to report a fellow officer throw in a pinch of collective bargaining that makes it spectacularly difficult to fire or discipline officers for misconduct and a smidgen of qualified immunity a legal doctrine originally meant to protect government employees from frivolous litigation, yet which has been warped into a highly effective shield in thousands of lawsuits seeking to hold cops accountable when they are accused of using excessive force. Whisk all these ingredients together and we end up with a social political cake that's been turning into ash in all our mouths. With a law enforcement apparatus, which not only enables, but actually fosters the abuse of power. With misconduct spreading within networks of officers like a virus. With few safeguards against inappropriate use of force from other officers, from higher ups like police chiefs, and even the Department of Justice and the courts, which has allowed too many of its members to act as judge and jury, punisher and executioner, and to disregard the sanctity of the constitution and even of human life. To think that it's okay to stand around for two minutes without providing first aid, and to allegedly kick another human being's body after shooting them twice in the back. I know not all cops have bad intentions. When someone chooses to become a police officer with a genuine desire to serve and protect citizens, that's a beautiful and honorable thing. But the system in which they operate is fundamentally broken. And this is a system we all live in and therefore are all a part of, whether we like it or not. So. How does the system need to change? We need to remember that many of the reforms being debated, bans on chokeholds, emphasis on de-escalation, community policing, a task force on policing, body cameras, though all common sense have been proposed or tried before, that reforms alone are not enough. We need to go deeper and re-examine our culture of criminal justice in so many modern societies. Two, we need to admit that we treat the police like a one-stop shop for a 
range of social services, from real emergencies to situations that cause us discomfort, that we ask too much from our officers. As former police chief David Brown pointed out in 2016. Every societal failure, we put it off on the cops to solve. Not enough mental health funding. Let the cop handle it. Not enough drug addiction funding. Let's give it to the cops. Here in Dallas, we got a loose dog problem. Let's have the cops chase loose dogs. It, the, you know, schools fail. Give it to the cops. Um, 70% of the African American community is being raised by single women. Let's give it to the cops to solve that as well. Stop. This, this is gonna be a little important later. Let's put a pin in this. We'll get back to this. That's too much to ask. Policing was never meant to solve all those problems. And I just ask for other parts of our democracy along with the free press to help us, to help us uh, and not put that burden all on law enforcement to resolve. So let's help them help us. Let's have professionals dedicated to responding to the 911 calls the police aren't meant to handle, including mental health, homelessness, substance abuse, animal control, and youth and other social services. Three, we need to follow the evidence and demilitarize civilian police. Research, which finds correlations between increased militarization and not only violent police behavior through increased killings of civilians and dogs. Oh my God, poor puppy but also increased violence against police, suggests demilitarization may secure overall community safety. Four, we need to recognize that police unions have this incredible, awesome power. Not awesome as in cool, like being able to control thunder, but monolithic, like controlling entire dominions through the one ring. This awesome power to hinder change, where if let's say a city council bans military style warrior police training, a union leader can say, fuck you, we're gonna do it anyway, and offer it for free. The Minneapolis Police Department will, will we believe, be the very first major department in the nation to prohibit fear-based trainings. If they deem that this training is in violation and they're on their own time and they want to attend it, I'm going to encourage officers to do it. I myself will be the first one to do it. If I would be disciplined, it would never be upheld. These four points can be summarized into three words. Defund the police, which I know sounds scary. I was scared when I first heard this term, but do you know what's even scarier? For me, while watching the video of George Floyd being murdered, the first thought, the first instinct I had was call the police. And that is a truly fucking terrifying revelation. What do you do when you need to call the police on the police? Oh my god, call the cops, please! I am the cops! I know the police are an existence that brings so many of us comfort and peace of mind. But even officers are aware that the people most likely to interact with the police, those involved in crime, victims of crime, or both, hold less trust and confidence in the police. That's not if most of the people who trust the police are the ones who don't actually encounter the police, that's not, that's, that's a fucking problem. Bad thing, bad. As someone who's had very few interactions with the police, the thought of having less officers on the streets made me feel uncomfortable and frightened at first. But what if instead of seeing it as having fewer cops, we see it as having more super cops armed to the teeth with training, multi-dimensional training, de-escalation training, mental health training, implicit bias training, empathy training, and yes, combat training so that officers can feel more confident in their abilities and are less likely to panic when they see another gun or a toy gun or a wallet or a hoodie. Oh, and history training, which we'll get to later. Also, as for the officers who will lose their jobs, how about reallocating the money used for misconduct settlements, which was $85 million in Chicago alone in 2018? With the $28 million in legal defense fees, that's a whopping $113 million of taxpayer money, which could be distributed among former officers for training or education to start a new career. 
everyone has the right to a livelihood. And the purpose of defunding the police is not to punish the police. It's hard. But instead of following our emotions or our abstract ideas about what the existence of the police should be, we can follow the evidence. Evaluate what's working, like the cops on dot strategy, having officers in high crime areas, but also actually interacting with and engaging the community, forging real partnerships with community leaders, and what isn't. Five, we can demand data and establish independent investigation because data on use of force and misconduct is notoriously difficult to extract. Even the FBI's national uniform database is voluntary. And we can't just rely on the reports written by the police officers involved in police shootings. Like, we don't do that for doctors facing malpractice charges. Also, it's worth noting that even this incomplete, biased database reveals that Black and Hispanic civilians are more than 50% more likely to experience some sort of non-lethal use of force even after controlling for context and civilian behavior, like resisting arrest or arguing with or threatening officers. Six, we need to see we can't reform law enforcement without changing how our courts and how our prisons work, without reforming the criminal justice system at large. To admit, in the face of evidence and what's essentially been a 50-year-long experiment, that mass incarceration does not lead to more public safety, that while it can reduce property crime, it does not reduce and in some cases can increase violent crime. One theory behind this counterproductive phenomenon is that incarceration itself is criminogenic, meaning that spending time in jail or prison actually increases a person's risk of engaging in crime in the future. This may be because people learn criminal habits or develop criminal networks. But the concrete collateral damage of incarceration is the deprivation of income, reduction of future opportunities, and the disruption of families and neighborhoods. Taking away parents who could otherwise help raise children and guide them away from criminal activities. Yeah, remember we said we'd get back to this point? Well, a 2007 report by the Department of Justice found that over 1.7 million children under the age of 18 in the U.S. had had a parent incarcerated in a state or federal prison. An 80% increase from 1991. Mass incarceration doesn't just hurt individual prisoners, it hurts families, communities, and the country as a whole. And on a related note, seven, we can end America's war on drugs, which has had repercussions around the globe, including capital punishment for drug offenses. And ironically, while the criminalization of marijuana spread from the US, America's legalization debate has yet to influence other countries in the same way. So that celebrities caught with weed have to literally prostrate themselves before the public in East Asia. Yeah, the reason I can't smoke a joint or enjoy a cannabis-infused gummy bear in Japan? Nixon's racist war on drugs? Just decriminalize drugs like Portugal has for decades. Or specifically in the case of marijuana, just legalize it. It's so much less harmful than alcohol. Oh, Canada. Oh my God, I feel so homesick. But also legalize it while being mindful of monopolization and how it exclusively makes the rich richer. Eight, we can admit all of us, police and corrections officers, prosecutors, judges, politicians, and civilians, that the very system, which so many of us are comforted by merely with its existence, so often fails those who actually interact and exist within it. We can admit that racism was entrenched in the very creation of these institutions and in our history as a society. Germany has set the perfect example of this. Going back to history training, every German police officer is required to pass a curriculum that includes police history, the role the police played in enforcing Nazi rule, including raids and mass shootings, and every new trainee must visit a former concentration camp. And this culture of remembrance goes beyond the police. It can be seen in every aspect of German democracy today. As I mentioned in a previous video, comparing how we remember Nazi Germany versus how we remember Imperial Japan, mandatory education about the Holocaust is implemented in detail with visits to museums and historical sites. And both Holocaust denial and symbols for uses other than education are illegal. 
Germany has shown that in order to make a break with a painful history, we as a society must fully admit, confront, and resolve the crimes against humanity we committed in the past. We don't necessarily have to feel guilty about history, but we do need to acknowledge it and the repercussions it has on our present. Aside from making admissions, what steps can we take as individuals? We can have discussions that can be uncomfortable with family and friends. We can move those discussions online via social media. We can protest as is a fundamental right in any true democracy. Of course, while taking all the precautions against spreading COVID-19 as recommended by the WHO, including keeping physical distance, cleaning our hands and wearing a mask. We can contact local politicians, also as is our fundamental right. And if you're not sure where to start, defund12.org has automatically populated emails with the email addresses of government officials in 38 different states. And we can educate ourselves on the evidence and on history. In order to understand what's happening, we need to know how we got here. And that includes 400 years of chattel slavery, as well as segregation that only stopped being legal in America 50 five years ago. I personally have a lot to learn. History was never one of my fortes, and I'll be dedicating a part of my live streams towards educating myself. You can find me on Twitch if you'd like to join the discussion. We can also donate to organizations that seek to protect constitutional rights and freedoms, as well as fight racial inequality. And lastly, we need to recognize that we can't just blame the police. The police and the criminal justice system are a reflection of a society's beliefs. Therefore, we can do some self-reflection and examine our own implicit biases, which won't be comfortable. This may be a strange, painful, an overwhelming moment in our lives, but it's also a pivotal moment in history, and we are all capable of affecting change. So many of our favorite stories are about individuals coming together in order to stand up to injustice, to fight oppression in so many fictional worlds. Star Wars. The Marvel Universe. One Piece. Avatar The Last Airbender. Harry Potter, and yes, Boku no Hero Academia, or My Hero Academia. How can we do any less in the face of the injustice that exists in reality? If you made it through this 4,500 word essay, thank you so, so much for listening. Also, this is not a fundraiser. But until Juneteenth, 2021, all profits from my photo store will be donated equally to the American Civil Liberties Union and the Clean Energy Innovation Program because social activism won't matter if the planet melts. And if you've already donated to an organization which fights to protect civil rights, fight police brutality, I'm gonna look at the I'm gonna look at the script. Um, it's like 2 a.m. and I'm sorry. Okay, let's look. Support families of the victims of undue force. Combat racial discrimination. Support youth in poverty-stricken neighborhoods. Reduce mass incarceration or fight climate change. I will gift you access to any cosplay digital set of your choice. Just let me know which fund you donated to in the comments below. Thank you so much again and. Please stay safe physically, mentally, and emotionally. Fist bump. Okay, telling the group that they are evil as a whole because somebody 150 years ago did bad things. Yeah, no, 100%. No, uh, yeah. Wait, is this chat caught up? Am I caught up? Yeah, again, and that's how I feel about Japan. Something that they did also not 150 years ago. Um, not even... A full century ago there are still people alive who remember that time and um, I think but even if they weren't around so yeah someone recently actually um, like forget Korea and Japan and like China and Japan but um, someone so a Jewish man is suing the train company the, uh, the train company that carried um, 
the victims of the Holocaust to their death, to the concentration camps. And they made a lot of money doing it. They actually made the um, the victims pay for their passage to their fucking deaths. So I actually didn't look up like uh, whether or not that went through, but I think that's a good example because so many times in the past, a lot of oppression, yeah, like racism and violence wasn't just for the fun of it. It was because it was also because they benefited directly economically or um, like politically some way like tangible benefit from the oppression of another group. And I think um, that's also something that should be recognized. For instance, um, yeah, all the forced labor that, yeah, Japan enforced. <laughs> Sorry, that's a weird sound. Okay, all the forced labor that Japan enforced. No, okay, all the forced labor that Japan um, did. Yeah, English, wow, great writer words. Um, basically, there's one like really cool island. I would actually like to go. It's a man-made island in Japan. I actually don't know where it is exactly, but... Uh, apparently the whole thing was basically built like it was constructed through forced labor and it's like mm, ooh, yeah that's uh like at least canada like one good thing that we do is try to recognize it so for instance our our railways were made with um were constructed by chinese men um who were treated who weren't slaves because they were paid it's just like they were really really you know, exploited, and um, they say that one man, one Chinese man died for, like, every, like, a lot of men died, and they were just absolutely used and abused, and, like, Canada at least, like, recognizes that? Does that make sense? Like, it's, it's, I'm Canadian, I didn't do it, that wasn't me, but I recognize that my, the, like, like, if I want to, be a part of Canada and all the wonderful things about it. And I do love my country. I need to also own the shitty things we did in the past. And that's not me bearing the sins. It's recognizing history and the legacy in the present. Am I making sense?